stuff. Uh, so first, RVM use system. If any of you are using RVM, please switch to the system Ruby, or things will explode. Um, this is your guys' time. So some of the goals that I came up with are things like understanding Ruby. Uh, there's a lot of Ruby magic behind Chef. Understanding basic Chef workflow um, and how things get done. Familiarity with the tools that are used to get Chef done. And overcoming the urge to be really mad at Ruby. So some terminology. Client is just a key pair. Uh, it allows you to auth authenticate with the Chef server. That's all. Node is just a machine you run Chef client on. Uh, and the Chef server will store some data about that. Knife is a command line tool that is used for interacting with the Chef server, both pulling data in and uploading things to the Chef server. Uh, Bergshelf is a fairly new tool that is used to manage cookbooks developed by others. It's similar to pip in Python or Ruby gems from Ruby. Food Critic is a linting tool uh, specifically aimed at Chef. Rubocop is also used. It's a Ruby linting tool similar to pep8. A uh, few other things we're going to be talking about is Test Kitchen, which is a framework for bringing up machines, running Chef, and then running tests. It's not specifically a testing framework. It's a framework for testing frameworks. Uh, and Server Spec is our favorite testing framework so far that we've been using. It's fairly nice. So let's start by going through some Ruby. Uh, Ruby is dynamic and strongly typed. That's kind of weird. That means there's no implicit typecast, with one exception. Uh, and the syntax is very implicit. This example is not too implicit, but we'll get there. That's well, showing up slightly differently. Cool. So in Python, if you define a function that just uh, sums two numbers, and then we print it out, um, in Ruby, you actually don't need parentheses for your function calls. So you can see at the bottom there, print sum 35. That is a totally normal function call. Most Ruby will still use parentheses if there's more than one, but it's not unusual to just drop parentheses entirely. So returns are implicit. Uh, in Python, they're very explicit. It's very obvious what you're doing. In Ruby, the last thing that you did is what's returned. Uh, so in the implicit foo there, uh, x.collect just returns an array, uh, and it takes every item in the array and adds one to it, and it returns a new array. So it increments everything by one, and it returns that array in the function. It's exactly the same as explicit foo, which just calls the return statement for you. There's no difference. Another strange thing in most languages, empty arrays, empty hashes, empty strings are all considered false type objects if you evaluate them to Booleans. That's not true in Ruby. In Ruby, the only things that are false are false and nil. If it is anything else and is not descended from false or nil, it's true in all cases. So here you can see in Python, if empty array would be false, so we run some function on the array. In Ruby, if array, that does not happen, and we return false. So every non-nil or false type? Yeah. So actually, it's really interesting. In the, the way they do this is there are four bit values. There's all zeros, which is Q false. Um, there is 8, uh, which is Q nil. There's Q true, which I think is 4. And then there is undefined, which is not actually undefined. It's just reserved. Um, anything, all they do is they take whichever one you evaluate to, they mask it with the complement of Q nil, and check if it's 0. So false and nil will go zero. Everything else will be non-zero. Um, and Ruby does not differentiate between uninstantiated objects versus instantiated objects or anything like that. Um, so if it That's one of the major gotchas of just kind of general Ruby. Um, Usually, if you want to check if something is empty or falsy, you use dot .empty or dot .nil. Uh, and Ruby uses X, uh, question marks at the end. That just means it's going to return a Boolean value. Uh, sometimes they also end it with P, which means predicate. Same thing. That's a lispism. Ruby really loves syntactic sugar. There is a famous clip about 
Ruby has two ways of doing things, the stable way and the way everyone else does it. And when you say syntax to sugar, what do you mean? Um, so for example, uh, we assign tests, the string test to a variable, and then the next two lines, the percentage sign w uh, is syntactic sugar for an array. You can see in the comment there I put um, what it would look like in kind of the normal Ruby syntax. Uh, the difference here is that if you do a capital W, it does interpolation uh, with the hash, bracket, hash curly brace. Uh, and if you do a lowercase w, it doesn't. Um, same thing with strings. A single quote will not interpolate anything. Double quotes will. So in this case, both of those, uh, the first two values, A and B, are the same. The last one is different because it's interpolation versus non-interpolation. Then we have 1 plus 2, which is actually a syntactic sugar for 1 dot plus 2, uh, which plus is just a method called on 1. Um, nice common methods like this that are defined in object or basic object uh, have this kind of syntactic sugar where you can do things. And actually, it turns out that dot method is also syntactic sugar for another method, which is send, uh, which just calls that method on that object. The last one is a little bit weird. Puts is how you print things in Ruby. And after that is a hash. So key 1 is key, 34 is the value, key 2 is a key, 42 is a value. In Ruby, you don't actually need the curly braces around the hash unless you really want them. Um, but it's if you see something that looks kind of hash-like but does not have curly braces, it probably actually is a hash. So procs. Procs are interesting. And I was hesitant to, to talk about these because they're complex and Ruby is strange, but they're really important to Chef. Chef does everything with procs. So proc is short for a procedure. It's kind of similar to a function that's not called in function data. So in Python, you could define a function. And then if you don't put the parentheses at the end, you're not calling the function. You can pass it around as data. So here we have def bar just prints out hello. And then in foo, it passes a function, calls that function. So foo bar will just print hello, just calls bar. In Ruby, we have bar equals proc, which is the, the keyword for starting a proc. And then do end is Ruby's way of um, delimiting its syntax. So in Python, you have white space. Uh, that tells you how everything is working. In Ruby, you have do end or curly braces. They're equivalent, but we'll get to that later. So then we define the function foo that just calls the dot call method on bar, which if bar is a method, we'll call the method. Uh, so foo bar prints hello. Same thing as the Python example, just a different way of getting there. Blocks are unnamed procs. Um, this is kind of weird. They're not lambdas, if you know what a lambda is. If you don't, you don't need to worry about it. Um, but a, a block is kind of a special version of a proc that you use everywhere and don't really always realize it. Uh, so if you see do end somewhere and it's not in a function definition, it's a block. And in Ruby, if you want to pass blocks around, you can put the ampersand before the argument in a function. So in def foo, we have ampersand block. That means, that tells Ruby I'm going to pass you a unnamed block of code later that I want you to run or that I want you to store. So do end is the argument of foo. Yes, yes. This okay. is this is a really good point. So here we have foo do end. This point is I can put parentheses right here and right here. That's how it would look in Python actually. I have parentheses there. In Ruby we drop those parentheses because we don't like parentheses. I don't know why. Uh, Ruby descended from Lisp. You think they would love them? <laughs> they don't. <laughs> Uh, and that's really important. You'll see that with Chef. Uh, Chef does this a lot. How is uh, a block not a lambda? A block is not a lambda because it is not refer. It's not. You can't refer to it ever again. So a lambda is essentially a function, right? It's an unnamed function. Right. Yeah. An function. Yes. A block and a lambda are very different in the sense that a block is not a function. It's just a chunk of code that has not been called. So Ruby has blocks, it has procs, it has lambdas, and it has functions, or methods, they call them. 
A proc and a lambda are almost the same thing. They treat them slightly differently in that a proc does not go into a deeper scope, whereas a lambda will start in a deeper scope on your stack. And methods are essentially just named lambdas. Blocks or not. Yeah, it's if you're really if you're curious about why this is not a lambda, it, you can go read about it. I can give you some links. Uh, come talk to me afterward. So here I wrote a little bit of Ruby that will actually completely fake Chef's syntax to show you that it Chef's syntax is just Ruby. It looks weird uh, if you've seen other Ruby. So at the top here we have package vim do action upgrade end. Uh, that's pretty much par for the course standard Chef. Um, nothing really special going on there. Uh, if any of you have seen Ruby before, it might look a little weird, but it's actually not. So if we go to the bottom here, I've defined action. Action is actually a function that's being called up here, uh, and upgrade is an argument that's being passed to the function action. Uh, so in this case, uh, we just pull up a proc, and it prints out apt get, and then we interpolate the variable, and there's also uh, this end here that can, you can worry about that later. Uh, so at this point, if you call just action upgrade, you will get a method that when you call that, will print out upgrade. That's it. And that little bit at the end. So then, there's actually a typo. There should be a hash right here, because we're going to pull like another variable in a minute. You might notice that. Now we define package, uh, which takes a name. It's n. It also takes a block of code, uh, which up here, is everything between the do and the end. This is exactly the same in Python. You would have a opening parenthesis around package. You would have a comma after the vim, the string, and you would have another ending parenthesis at the end of end. So uh, then in package, we just call this block of code. Uh, and curry is just kind of a special way of calling it with some more variables. And then. Here we have the same code again, and it prints packet upgrade then. This is essentially how Chef works. It does a little bit more magic because you can pass it more than one action or thing, function uh, in your block, and it will handle that. So it essentially just builds the hash for you and then passes the hash to what it, the action actually is. But that's Chef in a nutshell. You can expand it from there, which they did. Last thing, do an end, and curly braces are equivalent in Ruby you use curly braces if everything fits on a single line. And if you should fit everything on a single line. If you shouldn't, please use do end. So you can see uh, my first example is a little bit strange if you're not familiar with Ruby. It's just an array of one, two, three. Dot inject just means that we're going to call a block of code after this. Uh, in the parentheses, that zero means the starting variable in this block is going to be zero. Uh, so then in the block, we have the pipes around S and I. S is the value that you pass to inject. I is the iterator over the array. So on the first pass, S is 0, I is 1. We set S equal to S plus I, so 0 plus 1. Now, second time around, S is 1, I is 2. S plus I, S equal to S plus I gives you 3. Third time around, 3 plus 3 is 6. So at the end of that code block, you get the number 6. That's it. Next one down is a, another hash syntax. I keep putting different syntaxes for hashes, because you will see different syntaxes for hashes everywhere. It's something you unfortunately have to get a little bit used to. So here, the keys are 1 and 3, values are 2 and 4. Dot map just means you're going to pass it a block, and that block will do something on the keys and values. So in this case, I just print out what the key plus the value is, what the key times the value is. Um, so that would be, first case it would be 3 and 2, and the second case it would be 7 and 12. So that's 1 and 2, not 1, 2, 2? Yeah, yeah. So this KV is key value, right? So um, 1 is the key, 2 is the value. This hash only has two objects in it. it kind of, well, it has two keys and two values. But in Ruby, you can... I meant to kill X server before. Do I guess? In Ruby, um, oh, one of the other major differences that you were asking about, Justin, with um, procs and lambdas that are slightly different, it's not quite blocks. Um, 
Procs, you can pass as many arguments as you want. It will ignore all the rest that it doesn't use. Lambdas actually will throw an error if you don't pass the right number of arguments. So in this case, because we're just passing a block, uh, which gets converted to a proc, uh, we don't care. We could put like KB, comma, KB, comma, K, or K1, K2, comma, B1, B2, and lots of crazy things, pass as many arguments as we want. It'll just ignore those. So getting on to the actual chef stuff, um, things you need to be logged into a workstation. You need the admin private key, which I already have on NFS for you guys. You need the chef repo, which we'll check out in a minute. And you need the chef client private key, which we will generate. There's also, you need the chef validator. We'll get that too. So first thing, if you have not already cloned the repo, please do. Get clone, get it, get.osusl.org, colon chef slash chef dash repo. Uh, all of the developers have read write access to this repo. Feel free to work on it with us. We love you. Um, yeah, it might take a little bit for you guys to clone it. Who hasn't cloned it? Who's cloning it right now? You should be running this. Cool, thank you. Anyone else? OK. So once that's done, change into the repo. We use this thing called MR, which stands for my repo. I kind of hate it, but it works. So yeah, exactly. That's how I feel. Um, MR looks at a file in your home directory called mrtrust, and that takes a path to an MR config. And it won't run any MR commands if that, for that config if that config is not in your mrtrust file. Kind of silly, but that's how it works. So well, yeah. MR will execute anything you put in those config files. So yes. Kind of important that it, trusts it is important. <laughs> it's a little bit redundant because you should be trusting yourself to okay. have files in place, but. Yes, exactly. If you are running this on someone else's files, then that is more important. Uh, so then after that, MR init. Uh, Lucy and Elijah, how are you guys doing? Did you get the repo checked out? OK, still following along? OK, so MR init, that should take forever. And it will pull in a bunch of Git repos for you and put them all in the right places. If it's not working, let me know. After that, uh, for everyone, if you don't have a .chef in your home folder, please make it now. We will be copying some files into there right away. Uh, copy all of those. If you do this on the workstation, it will just work. You all have read access to the .chef folder for the moment. Uh, you need the encrypted data bag secret, the admin.pem, the validator.pem, and you put them in your own chef folder on NFS. We'll be using those in a minute. Is everyone? Yeah, Ken, what's up? My, my MR is very confused about the init. OK. Yeah, same here. OK, what's your error? Well, unknown action init. It should be MR. I thought there was one you had to start with. No. OK. It, it, it I don't know why I wrote it. Yeah, yeah, it should be MR update. Yeah, then do update, please. Sorry. And you can do parallel uh, things if you do MR dash J. Yeah, it takes standard make flags for some things. So like if you do MR dash J and then like four, it'll do four parallel git pull up and checkouts. Yep. I made an alias for my MR, I always just do that. <laughs> it speeds it up a lot. It does. Uh, one other thing is if you guys are like me and you like to fetch and rebase, you'll hate MR because MR has no concept of rebasing. It has concept of fetching, just not rebasing. Um, so I don't really use MR all that much, which is probably why I got that wrong. MR is just an interesting way of getting all of the Git repositories checked out in the correct format. Yep. The same how everything is. That's basically all it does. Yep. You don't use it that often. Just MR yeah, update when you start, and then you're pretty good. It's very simple, but it's also very stupid. So for example, if you've checked out a new branch in one of the cookbooks eventually, and you try to run MR, and you only can run MR at the very top. Yep. Only where your .MR config is. It'll, it'll say, it'll give an error because it's not a master, and you can't, you're not tracking that that's tree or something. So yep. that's okay. It's not like MR is broken. It's just it's yep. very dumb and stupid. If it fails, it's totally fine. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So MR in it is not working. Um, this MR legal setting include gets cat dot uh, MR config dot. Did you type MR update? I did. That got the same error. Uh, it's just here. Trust is probably set Oh, the non-trust it. Got it, got it. So, uh, cat, your .mrtrust, 
Yeah, it's stressed. Uh, okay. okay. I missed it. Yep. Can you get it now? And you got those files copied over already? Cool. Okay. Elijah, did you get a chance to copy the files yet? Uh, just give me like two seconds. Yeah, sure. I want to open another shell and copy it as well. MR is running. It'll take a while. Does anyone have any questions so far? No? Complaints about Ruby already? You were saying this, you don't run MRFA very often? Yeah. So um, I like to use git fetch and rebase. Uh, MR will basically just do a pull. Uh, the difference being that by default, pull will merge. And I don't like doing merges uh, from or from branches I'm tracking into branches I'm working with. Yeah, probably. But I spend that time to do that. Yeah. I only run MR update when I want to get a fresh checkout of everything. Yep. And I know everything is in a state that's clean. I After wouldn't use it if I'm editing something and I haven't checked anything yeah. yet. Yeah. Also, it's really nice if you want to do like an MR, want to do graph across our entire. Plus yeah. Kind of works. It's better than regular rep. It depends. It depends on each repo individually. So if yep. you click 100 repos, you get 100, nothing found, nothing found, nothing found, and your results scrolls by. Yep. But the nothing found is standard, or standard error, right? Okay, so you can always pipe that into Dev and Fair enough. How are you doing, Elijah? Um, so I ran MR update, not getting a bunch of like MR checkout commands failed. Interesting. It's running through all the things. And okay. Tell you know, so what, the MR part's not super important, so yeah. I'll help you afterwards. Okay, and I copy all the You copy all the files? Cool. Moving on. Um, now you get to use the admin key to generate your own key. Some of you have already done this. Others, if you don't have a, uh, a client key, then you need to do this, preferably now. Do knife configure dash i. That will run knife's magical configuration, which will generate a key for you. Uh, it's going to ask you a lot of questions. Defaults are pretty much OK. The only ones you want to change are the chef server URL, the admin's private key, and the validation key. Uh, the validation key and the admin's private key you should have copied into your own .chef folder, so whoever you are, home slash you. And I'll put it there. It's going to ask you a lot of questions. It takes a little while to get through. Uh, there's a password at the end. You have to enter more than six characters, or it will completely fail out, and you have to start over. Is there anyone who, who's running this right now? OK. Cool. More than one. Anyway, uh, it'll also ask you for a path to the repo. You can pass it the path to the repo. That'll set a few things up for you. We actually have another knife config in our repo, so if you're in the root of the repo or anywhere below that, it will use that config instead of your own, which makes your own kind of unnecessary. You just need the key. Oh, and the password at the end, you'll never use again, ever. It's used for the Chef web UI. Um, if for some reason you wanted to log in, and use the, we don't run the web UI, so you can't. I'm sorry. Are the slides on the tubes anywhere? Huh? Are the slides online anywhere? They will be. I mean, they actually, they are online okay. right now. Okay. Huh? For like where? Uh, so it's slides uh, dot uh, prismatic. Uh, uh, prismatic. It's my own domain. Okay. Do it's nice. prismatic green, all one word, dot com. Okay. Let me see. Yep, it's right there. You follow along at home. Uh, can I find a server? Oh, right. 
Did you, if you look up there, um, that's how it's spelled. It's a spelling test, too. <laughs> I like long domain names. My favorite domain names was one that we had at Rackspace. It was .k1k.me. We called it kickme, as in kick the servers, because they are down. It was entertaining. Okay, how are you guys doing on the knife configure? You got your keys yet? Hey, Jack, can you do me a favor and shut the door? Thank you. How are you doing, Jeffrey? Good? Cool. Are you ready to move yeah. on? Yeah? I have slides, too. Okay. Lucy, are you ready? Yeah. Cool. Now we're moving on. That's the boring part. You only have to do that once. Don't ever lose that key or you have to do it again. It's kind of annoying. Chef components. The main, the big five things in Chef. There's cookbooks, uh, which are things that you run. Nodes, which are things that are run on. Roles are an abstraction of things that multiple nodes should have. Environments is a further abstraction on top of roles, but a node can only have one. We'll talk about that later. Data bags are data that you want that is not necessarily associated to a node, but you need during the chef run. Uh, they can also be encrypted separately, which means lots of people and everyone should do this, should put any kinds of passwords or anything they use in your chef run in an encrypted data bag. It's good practice. So we'll start with cookbooks. Um, the really major parts of cookbooks that you're going to be working with, there's attributes, which is just data. Recipes, which is the important thing that runs everything. Files and templates, which are things that get copied over. Libraries and definitions, they're kind of helpers for cookbooks. Uh, we won't really cover those right away. Uh, if you guys have questions about them, come ask me. There's also lightweight resource providers. A resource is a thing that does something in Chef, and provider is how it actually does it. So for example, package is a resource, whereas apt package is a provider for the package resource. There's also the yum package, which tells you, you know, Debian and Ubuntu use apt, CentOS, Red Hat, Fedora, everyone else uses yum. Chef's smart enough to pick which one. So attributes are strange because they can be defined everywhere, and they have an overriding merge system which is kind of funky. So they can be defined in a cookbook, in a node, in a role, and in an environment. Uh, in general, the most specific one wins. So node always wins if you define it in a node. However, there's also four levels of attributes. There's default, normal, and override. Override always beats normal. Normal always beats default. Uh, so if you have a environment attribute uh, set to override, it will be a node attribute set to normal or default. There's also automatic, which is special. You can't change those. Um, they are things about your server that shouldn't change, things like your FQDN, your IP, uh, what platform you're running on, your kernel name. Uh, there, Chef has a special tool that goes through and generates all these. Uh, it does it every run, um, just to make sure nothing's changed. And if it has, it changes it. So attributes in the cookbook are found in a directory called attributes, of course. Um, the first line there is the syntax for how it looks in the attributes file, uh, which is a little different how it looks in the, rest, in the recipes in the cookbook. Uh, you say default, that's just, that specifies the attribute level. You can also say normal or override. Uh, and then it's just a hash. So you pass it some keys and a value. In this case, my cookbook, you should always namespace your attributes in cookbooks with your cookbook name. So this cookbook is called my cookbook because I'm very creative. And I want to install Vim, so I need an attribute called package I want to install. Uh, in recipes, you can define attributes. You generally don't want to. Um, that's why there's an attributes directory. You should use that. Uh, the only time you should do it in a recipe is if the attribute is depending on other attributes or some crazy logic that you can't do in an attributes file. Attribute files are just pure Ruby, though, so you can do whatever you want in them most of the time. There's very rarely a good reason to write it in a recipe. Uh, and if you go to access a uh, an attribute, they're all under node. Node is whatever current node you're on that's running the thing. And it's just a hash. It's actually not a hash. It looks like a hash. It smells like a hash. So it's a hash. Resources, uh, like I mentioned before, these are the important an abstraction of the important things to do. So like packages or uh, templates or files or services. Things like that are all resources. They do most of the real work um, and are what allow Chef to be cross-platform. 
most things you do that are important are defined via resources. And syntax for resources looks like that. This is what I was getting to earlier with Jack, is that resource is actually a function. Name is an argument, and this block is a uh, So syntax looks a little weird if you're used to regular Ruby. But it's actually not. It's just one giant function call um, passing a block. And Ruby likes to make things look weird. So it looks kind of weird. So uh, there's some common resources in the sit bottom. There's some universal options. All resources have these options. They're action, subscribes, notifies, only if, and not if. Only if and not if are used for control. Uh, if you want to only run a resource in certain cases, you use only if or not if, depending on how you set up your logic. Subscribes and notifies are how actions define actions on other, or sorry, how resources define actions on other resources. So say you have a Apache config or a vhost. And whenever you change it, you would like to restart the Apache service. You would send a notifies from the, you define it in the config template that you're copying over, and it would notify the service to restart. So then any time that the template changes, the service will also restart and pick up those changes. So you'll see, you'll see notifies a lot. Subscribes is the opposite. If you have a something that wants to re, to run an action, like restart a service. Um, you can define it in the service itself instead of in the files. That's fairly rare, um, at least in kind of sto normal standard usage. So here's some examples. Uh, the first one, package Apache 2 installs fairly basic. Um, the default action for packages is actually installed. All resources have a default action, so it's nothing. Usually it's not nothing. So in this case, you can actually just do package Apache 2 and leave off the block and it will install it for you. Then we also have service Apache 2, uh, which is the service that's starting to do action. You can pass multiple actions. You have to pass them as an array. So services, you want to both enable. So if your server goes down and comes back up, it gets restarted and comes back up at boot time and start, which just runs it automatically. If you did enable, it wouldn't start it. It would just enable it, and it would wait until you were rerunning all your stuff to actually start, unless you have a fancy new init service like SysMD. And then we have a template example here. This is a little bit more complicated. Um, the template name <coughs> is the direct is the uh, location on the node where the file will end up. So in this case, it's Etsy Apache to the site available on my site.com. If you're familiar with Apache, that's a standard vhost location. Then we have this nice big block source tells you. Uh, what the template name is in the cookbook. Uh, I'll show you guys an example of that later. Owner and group are just owner and group of the file on the node. Mode 0644. Mode is octal and we, when we pass it from Ruby, so we add the zero in front. Um, if you know your modes, you can also pass 00644, which is the exact same thing. Um, when you do CH1, the zeros, any leading zeros are optional. So that's not your standard 0644, it's optal 644. A little bit different. We have a notifies example. Uh, so this notifies, it sends the restart action, it's an action up here, um, to the service Apache 2. Uh, the way you do it is resource bracket, resource name, which in this case is Apache 2. The last thing on here is a special function just for templates, variables, and it is just a hash. So in this case, I've kind of shortcutted the hash. I haven't put any curly braces or parentheses or any other syntax or sugar around it. It passes this value or this key, some other variable, and example is its value. We'll see a little bit more of that right now. Templates. Uh, how does yeah. the scoping with that work? Because restart, restart is. You should look at my slide. All right. Yes. So uh, templates are just ERB. If you're familiar with Ruby, you probably have heard of ERB. It's pretty basic. There's only really a couple things you can do. You can do this open bracket with a percentage sign. They all start with that. Do an equals. That means just take the value from whatever I'm passing you and put it there. You can do without the equals. That means I'm giving you actual Ruby. You should run it. And here I have another example, which is at sign in front of my variable. That is a Ruby thing. It's actually an instance variable. Um, but all that really matters is it's the same thing that I passed it right here. 
very similar to our example. So uh, this would print out nothing, because this variable doesn't exist in the binary anywhere. This would also print out nothing. Um, but if some bar was set to something, it would, these two lines would be the same. And this one, which is an example, no quotes. Here's a better example. Uh, so you see, uh, I put an array at the top that's just the regular Ruby. Then I print out the first value in the array, so that's one. There's um, in the ERB, it's literally just embedded, so if there's not the brackets in the percentage set around something, it will literally come out with whatever's saying there. So like the first time I heard, yeah, the first text that's outside of the brackets print out exactly the same. Uh, and all these brackets are evaluated. So first variable and I raise one. Then we go down to the next one. Uh, this is the array dot inject like I was talking about earlier. Then instead of this is just the same summing actually. So one plus two is three. And at the end, I do exactly the same thing. The difference is here I use puts, which is just printing it out, and here I use equal sign, which is generally what you would do. But I just wanted to show that they're essentially the same thing. Equal sign is just nicer because you don't have to put puts in front of everything, or just some other printing method. Ruby has a few others because it has a million ways to do everything. Files are just like templates. Templates, so just like that template resource I showed you back here, very similar. Just in this case. Um, Resource name is remote file. That's a strange thing from the old days of Chef when there was such a thing as. I think it's a backup. Should be cookbook file now, I think, is it? Remote file. Sorry, there's a remote file and there's cookbook file, and they switched them at one point where remote file used to only be things like you go grab them from the URI, you go grab them from some website somewhere. So actually, that should be cookbook file. I'm sorry. Uh, name and location, exactly the same as it was in the template. That's the block, owner, group, uh, exactly the same as they were in the template. Um, files live in the files directory under default. Um, everything will probably go under default. But there's actually kind of a magical structure where under the files, but before the default in any cookbook, if you put a folder with a nodes.qdn, it will use that directory instead of the default one. Uh, you can also do it for platforms as well. So you put like Ubuntu 12.04, uh, it will use that. Those files just for Ubuntu 12.04 and nothing else. That's, yeah, what's up? But this, don't you have to give it a source? Like you say. Source is implied. Thank you for bringing that up. So um, let's go back to the template example for a second. My it when it um, goes to this source, is actually entirely redundant. It's the same thing with that. The default source is the file name at the end plus .erv. So my com, my site.com, my site.com .erv. I can drop the source line and it would do it just the same. So in files, instead of adding the .erv, it adds nothing. Um, so if the file name where it's going to go live in your system, if you had .bash rc in file slash default or some other folder, it would just copy that. Um, most people still specify source because it's, yeah, what's up? Sorry, I thought you were reasoning that. Stretching. stretching. OK. Um, generally, you actually don't really want to use files that much because copying straight files around is a pain. There's a lot of them. You'll, you usually want templates. So let's talk about node data. Uh, it's just JSON. You can store it in Ruby, but no one does. Uh, if you upload it to a Chef server, it gets converted to JSON and it's forever after JSON. So I know one uses Ruby. You shouldn't do it either. It's annoying. Um, all node data should be specific to just the node. If it is not specific to just the node, it should go somewhere else, like in a role or an environment. So I have kind of an example here. I pared it down a little bit. Um, the node data is actually fairly long, but I, I like things to fit on the slides. So it has a name that is required. That's the name of the node. Um, and if the name of the node does not match the name, then it doesn't use that data. Chef environment also required. If it's not there, it's default, underscore default. In this case, we call one of our environments production and run list. Run list is how you specify roles and recipes that you want to run. So in this case, we have a role called rack tables, and we want silk or node to run everything in this role. You'll see an example of roles in a minute. There's also the James master role, same thing. 
recipe git. Git is a cookbook name. If there's nothing after the cookbook name, it assumes you want the default recipe. There's literally the recipe name the default. Uh, if you don't want the default recipe, like here in OSLSLAP-D, you add two colons and something else, whatever your recipe is called. So there it's called client. So uh, in the OSLSLAP-D cookbook, under the recipes directory, there's a file called client.rb. That's the one that gets run. Roles are basically no data that applies to more than one node. Uh, so they have a run list. This is the uh, Project Drupal role, it's actually almost entirely copied directly. They just have a couple of extra actions that they take off. Basically, this one actually does absolutely nothing. Uh, they don't use the role very much, but it's a good one to look at. So you have your own list, exactly the same as the node run list. Anything in there will get uh, expanded. And we're on the node. Chef type, this is important. That's how the chef server knows what this random JSON capacity is. It's a role. Default attributes, that's default level attributes. You could also have override underscore attributes, normal underscore attributes, no automatic, you can do that. Based on class, check role, also required description, role for all Drupal servers, and the name of the role is project underscore Drupal. So in our files, it's project underscore Drupal uh, The name, if you have any kind of JSON data that has a key of name or ID, the file should always match it minus the extension. So drop off the .json in this case. Oh, and one other thing, this end run list is pretty cool. Um, all nodes have exactly one environment, which I'm getting to here. And that run list, you can specify per environment run list. So if you have, say, a development environment and you want to run lots of extra things that break everything, you can specify the role without having to make yet another role. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's actually really useful. Uh, yeah, thanks, you said a couple of things. I couldn't remember where the example was. I think it got committed back out. Environments. Environments are exactly like roles in notes, but they don't have run lists. The run lists go in the roles for per environment. So everything in an environment should be very pretty general data. Uh, in this case, this is part of the dev environment. There's basically nothing other than I added an attribute called adder and value. I'm really uncreative. Development environment, description, JSON class, chef type, you're probably seeing those by now, override attributes, there's nothing, and that's it. So uh, any node that would have this would just have this default attribute, add or value, added to the node, and run that, unless it overwrote it from the node or the role or a cookbook. Everything overwrites environments. They're not very special. Data bags, yet more JSON. Uh, stuff that doesn't really belong to notes. This is kind of a bad example because IP addresses are very specific to notes. But um, there's also some other good reasons for running them. Uh, things like you can specify lots and lots of data bags in a directory, and you can iterate over the entire list of direct the entire list of data bags and do something with all of them. So in this case, um, here we have some key values. That's all it is. Um, and we have a networking recipe that if this ID matches kind of closely to a known name, then it will create this interface for you inside all these values. Uh, and so we run this recipe on everything. If you don't have the data back, it just says, OK, sure. No data back. Um, these, this is just entirely key value storage, nothing special. Uh, when you call it in a recipe, which I can show you later, it's just a hash. That's all it is. Uh, data bags can also be encrypted, which is cool. It's the only way you can really encrypt things in Chef. Um, no data by, by default gets passed over HTTPS, so when you pass it around, it's not passed in plain text, but you should really use data bags if it's sensitive. Uh, test Kitchen. Test Kitchen does everything except for run tests. It runs the test framework for you, and those run the actual tests. Has a plugin system. Uh, it calls them drivers, which are basically ways that you can spin up a virtual machine. Uh, so things like Vagrant, VirtualBox, OpenStack, Amazon EC2, Rackspace, whatever you want. DigitalOcean. Lots of people use DigitalOcean. And that's all the plugin system does for Kitchen. Just drivers. Um, 
Test Kitchen understands a fairly comprehensive list of testing frameworks, including RSpec, which is a fairly standardized Ruby um, test framework. It's actually not used to check very much. Server spec, the one I mentioned before. Bass, which is kind of weird. It's almost like just Bash, but it's in Ruby, but it's less a Bash. Chef spec is a more specialized version of server spec, which allows you to do some things, but it also loses some of the niceness about server spec. Um, it's gotten a lot better. It's a bit newer, so it's much more immature. Test Kitchen has lots and lots of magic. Um, in general, if something looks like there's not enough data to it, it's because Test Kitchen is adding a lot more data. I'll show you an example. Uh, .kitchen.yaml in the root of the cookbook is where you put all your configurations. There's no reference documentation, so good luck if you need to know it. If you look at the source code of the test kitchen repo and you look in like some of the specific directories, you can figure yep. things out pretty easily. The source code's actually very readable. It's very readable. Um, that's how I figured out. I was like, oh, that's what they asked for this. <laughs> there's also a command called kitchen diagnose, which will basically tell you absolutely everything um, that happens during runtime. So here's a very simple example of the YAML. Driver, Vagrant, that's the default one. It always works that way. There's a plugin for it, too, but that's included by default if you install Test Kitchen. Provisioner, that's going to be Chef Solo, Chef Server, Chef Zero. Am I forgetting one? Yeah, that's it. Uh, the difference between Chef Zero and Chef Server, Chef Zero also has a server, but it runs locally. Uh, so it spins up the server on the VM and then also talks to the server itself, which is nice if you want to test server things without actually connecting to a real server. Uh, it's fairly useful, but it's pretty specialized. Platforms, those are just the names of things that you want to run all of these tests on. Um, if you don't see any other data under platforms, Test Kitchen is smart enough to know that you mean you want this platform from Opscope and it will go figure out what your driver is and pull in the right stuff. Uh, it doesn't do it for all drivers. For example, OpenStack, you have to specify some more information because you can't just import an image into OpenStack through Test Kitchen. That would be really painful. But since we're using Vagrant, we can see 12.04. Test Kitchen knows to go look on Opscode stuff, pull in a Vagrant box, if you know what a Vagrant box is, which is just an image, uh, and use So first of all, Center and Test Kitchen will do lots and lots of downloading of things, especially if you use uh, a lot of platforms. After that, you don't really download anything. Everyone uses Opsets boxes because they're easily available. Suites are actual test cases you want to run. So suites, basically anything can take runs and attributes uh, under any of these sections. But suites are where they usually go. Um, that's where you tell it, I want you to do this, and it goes and runs that on the server, or sorry, on the VM you made. And then under the test directory, which I'll show you in a minute, suites are get you name all of the tests you want to run on a suite after that suite. You name it after the suite. In, uh, in the front, I just put the link to the one that Anthony wrote, so it cool. goes and it shows how the difference is. Yeah, thank you. Some useful kitchen commands. List create. Uh, list just tells you all available platform combinations. So you have a combination of your driver, your provisioner if you have more than one, which is fairly rare, and your platform. So it'll be, I believe, driver-provisioner if there's more than one dash platform. So in this case, we would just have vagrant dash equal to 12 and 4, so we only have one provision that drops it out. And vagrant dash, actually, it'd be default. We only have one driver. Uh, so it just means it default equal to 12 and 4, default sent on 64, default sent 5. If we added an OpenStack uh, driver, like Anthony has on his example configuration, then we would have. Four we would have twice as many platforms. We would have vagrant dash even two twelve four or default if we specify that vagrant's the default, and OpenStack dash even two twelve four in CentOS. So you get a combinatoric increase very quickly if you have lots of platforms, and every suite also gets it. So it's a combination of the suite name, platform name, provisioner name, driver name, four things. It's, usually you don't see provisioner. So kitchen list lists all of those. It also lists the state of them if it knows the state. Um, it's not always that great at tracking the states of some of the driver ones, like OpenStack. Uh, it's possible to create an OpenStack setup through Test Kitchen, and then Test Kitchen will magically forget about it. And then you'll leave some OpenStack server VMs running on OpenStack. They build up, but don't worry about that too much. Create all does create machine, doesn't do anything else. 
destroy it, destroy it. That's all it does. Converge, if it's not created, we'll create it, and we'll run check on it. Won't run any tests. Verify, we'll run the tests. And setup is just like converge, except it destroys it at the end. No, setup does it. Sorry. Setup can destroy it at the end. Only test destroys it at the end. Setup does not. Test runs create, converge, and verify. Um, and then if all of your tests are successful, it assumes you want to destroy the VM. There's a flag to stop it from doing that, but it doesn't always work. If you run setup and you already have a VM created, it will destroy it and create it over there. It assumes you want a new one. So in general, after you create the first one, you probably want to run converge and verify. And when you're all done writing all of your code, you will want to do it from scratch again just to make sure you didn't do any weird statefulness. The Burks file uh, lives in the root of the repo. It's important for Test Kitchen. Uh, Test Kitchen will look at it and automatically pull in all the cookbooks. So you have to specify dependencies in the metadata for your cookbook. And then if you want to use them in Test Kitchen, which you have to, you specify them in the Burks file as well. So for example, I saw this one mostly from our base cookbook. It has lots of dependencies. I believe if Workshop also is smart enough to pull in dependencies of dependencies. It carries out the whole chain. It's pretty good at it. Uh, the, this set of cookbooks actually ends up pulling in like 54 cookbooks. It's kind of interesting. You can specify cookbooks via Workshop's API, uh, which used to be slightly different than Workshop's various syntax. Uh, if you don't specify anything after the cookbook name, it assumes you want that one, your source. Uh, so on the MS updater, we need to get directly from the Workshop API. Uh, the rest of these, since we specify them in Git, that means we need to just start to pull from Git. Oh, those, some of those are private repos, which is why we specify them in Git. And we don't have things on the Workshop API. You can actually run your own Workshop API, which I'm in the middle of getting set up. That'll be cool. Metadata at the end just means pull in this own cookbook that it's in. Um, so it pulls in the cookbook that you're currently working on. You have to have that. Gem file is also important because it is what tells the, it's what tells Test Kitchen what gems you need to install on the VM. So for this example, uh, we want to use server spec. These ones are kind of default. Everyone puts them there. They're actually important, even though they're kind of not. But you should put them there or things will fail. There's also one called Buster, which you should always add. I don't know why I didn't add it here. Uh, Buster is what runs all of the test frameworks. Server spec pulls in Buster. Sometimes. It can still fail. <laughs> you should specify all the gems you need. Um, uh, this is one where it's, I'm not sure why it fails. I haven't really dug down into the issues. Uh, tests. Tests live in test slash integration slash your platform name. So that would be things like Ubuntu 12.04, CentOS 6.4 in this example. And after that, it's slash the name of your test framework. So this one would be server spec, because this test is in server spec. And then it's just a Ruby file in there. Uh, test Kitchen will copy it over and run it. And if you don't specify server spec, you're done by the way. It's pretty familiar. Required. Yeah. I changed it a little bit just to add comments. So here is magical Ruby sugar syntax. Uh, this just makes an array. It, you could specify a bracket, quote, Pascal, end quote, comma, quote, Pascal, Ashman, end quote. It's actually not that much more work to do that, but people don't. The group is just pretty easy. Dot each just means we're going to iterate through this. We pass, dot, we pass each to block. Do P is the argument that we want to pass in the block. So P is going to be Haskell or Haskell min, as you can see um, right here. Describe package. This is server spec syntax. Uh, describe package P, pass a block. It should be installed with version in this case. Nance wrote this just two days ago, I think. It's a pretty good example. And at the end, we also have a described file. Um, it should be executable. If you look up the server spec documentation, they have this great big page on resources and all the different things you can do. You can do really cool stuff. You can run an arbitrary command and then do a regex on its output if you want. Actually, this test has that. I just chopped that off and it to fit on my slide. Do you guys want to see a test kitchen demo? Yay. This is fun. <laughs> so. Oh, I 
Mm. I thought. Change that to like. Better? Yep. Cool. Oh. So, um. Actually, I'm not going to detect. We'll just make a bunch of folders and stuff for you. In actually, I'm going to show you guys my. Pretty much automatically created for you. The important thing on here is cookbook path, so it knows where for cookbooks when you run my commands. Uh, also, your pine key and some of the other things we set up earlier dumps all that for you. Uh, yeah, that's your nice config. There's lots of actually really cool things. It's Mostly entirely undocumented. Uh, most of Chef is missing a lot of documentation. So if we go. We can see. It's not there. Cool. That means it is somewhere else. Case path. Yeah, so my bit actually screwed up. It didn't put it in the read. It put it. It creates all of these different folders for you. Um, you'll, generally, most of them will be erased, actually. You want attributes, that's important in the files, usually important in metadata that are, are being important, we'll show you that in a minute. Recipes and templates. Uh, the resources, providers, libraries, definitions usually go away if you don't need them. Yeah, or you can delete them. I just, I like to RMRF things. It's kind of fun. So, uh, this is our metadata. Pretty basic right now. Um, it's like I've automatically generated for us. Name is what I passed it. Since my knife.rb has already here, we can't handle the license stuff. It automatically copies that in. Description, it just says install slash configures whatever the cookbook name is. It's automatic. This long description is because on the Chef has a um, API for like ops code, sorry, not Chef. The people who wrote Chef have an API for community written cookbooks. And the site used to grab this long description, and it would dive into the main page of the cookbook. It's really annoying uh, because people would put their entire readme as this one variable in your group. So people started figuring out, well, you can just open the readme and dump it all in here. And since it's Ruby, it will do all that for you. And then version 010 is the default. I don't know why they don't start with 001, but they don't. So that's the metadata. Um, let's add a dependency, actually. Um, so if your cookbook depends on another cookbook, it's very useful. Uh, and then under recipes, right now the only recipe is default. Nice little license blurb. And that's it. So, use another recipe in a recipe. There's a. So, we do apt. And in this case, if there's some other recipe, it would be colon colon recipe name. Is it standard to always put default? Do you want some to people to? like to always put default, some people don't. I prefer it. I, that was my question. I won't get angry. If someone doesn't do it and opens a pull request, I won't well, quote. No. Um, it's kind of weird. Some Rubyists like to be explicit about random things. Ruby is a very implicit language, but they will be explicit about default, because they can be. Um, and let's install, I could put action, but most people don't do that if it's just one line. Okay. One thing. If you just want to do one package, you do that. Or if you want to do multiple packages, you do that percent sign. Yep. 
That's it. Uh, the reason I'm including the apt recipe apps, um, if you know how apt get works, it it splits up the grabbing all of the new information from the repository and actually doing anything with that information, unlike yum. Um, and it turns out it has a couple of weird things. Like if you just try and install something off of the old information, it won't work. It will try and pull in an old version that doesn't exist anymore. So people saw that with the app cookbook, which has some extra magic that will run apt-get update anytime you do anything important and before you install packages. Uh, it does some smart magic to figure out when you should do that. So you don't have to include apt, because this could be for CentOS or something? Yeah. So, so if you don't, does it just, uh, let's say you're requiring both apt and yum. Yeah. Package is smart enough to check platform no. and use the corresponding one? Well, it's smart enough to check platform and use the It's smart enough to check the resource and the platform and use the right provider. It's not smart enough to do anything about the other cookbooks. If I specify include recipe, It will run that recipe, no matter what. It assumes that I know better than Chef. Um, it turns out that apt and yum don't do anything if they're not on the right platform. So in this case, it's actually entirely safe to have both. In general, um, well, the fact the translate package name and Yes. You still have to be careful about that. It's not like Yes. The way you usually do that is through attributes. I can show you that in a little bit. Let's just start with this. Jay Noah says that whenever you type, you can't hear anything you're saying. Oh, OK. Just, just so you know. Interesting. I'll try and separate but, typing and talking. Yeah, yeah either talk loud or I think you said it just cuts out. I type loudly, so it's not surprising. 30 seconds, you'll find out. Yes, 30 seconds, you'll hear yeah. us talking about it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, now if I were to run this, it would, let's open up a Burks file. that I showed you guys. If Ruby were really cool, it would figure that out. I would love Ruby then. Kitchen.yaml, you can run kitchen init, and it will create the kitchen.yaml with kind of some defaults. It will create the test integration slash default, uh, which is your default platform. Or sorry, that's your default suite, not platform. Uh, it also runs gem install, because it assumes you don't have um, kitchen dash favorite installed, even though you already do on the workstations. You can just ignore that. Uh, and if you're on the workstations you, uh, and you run this command, you'll probably get an error saying Chef UK is not in the path. It actually is. Um, Kitchen's not smart enough to realize that it's wrong. So now we have our Burks file. We have our kitchen.yaml. We still need a gem file. We can actually do anything important. Burks files are modeled after gem files, uh, so they look pretty similar. So both are just Ruby. So if you want to do crazy complex Ruby in them, you can. Uh, most people avoid it because they should be fairly explicit. Um, but there's, there are actually a couple of cases where it's good to do that. So we want gem buster, gem server spec, gem test kitchen. I don't know why kitchen init doesn't add that for you. I should fix that. Does a Burk just do that if you use Burks to create the cookbook? Yeah. So there's about 7,000 different ways to create cookbooks. You can use Knife. You can use Knife Spork, which is a Knife plugin. Knife has plugins um, that we use fairly often, which is basically just the same thing as Knife. Uh, you can use Burks to create it. You can just create all these files by hand if you happen to know all of them and really Hate type you love typing, but things that are you know all the time. Um, there's a few other ways to create them too. So we have our Burks file, we have our gem file, we have our .kitchen.yaml. Let's take a look at that. Um, 
straightforward. Driver, vagrant, provisioner, 1204, CentOS 64. All exactly the same as what I showed you in that example. Suites, default, has a run list. It automatically includes our default recipe from our cookbook. Uh, if we had more recipes, it would not include them. You'd have to add that yourself. Attributes, if we want to add attributes, we don't have any yet that we need, so we won't add any there. I don't have to include recipe apt here because uh, the chef workshop test default recipe includes it for me. Uh, your run list gets expanded with all of the include recipes from everything in your run list. And actually, when you run um, chef client against a chef server, at the end of the run, it will save your entire expanded run list to the server as node data, which is really cool because later then, if you want to find out everything that is running this one particular recipe, but this one particular recipe is not in your actual run list, it's included in another recipe that includes it, in, that is in your run list, it'll still be there, so you can search on it. So you just use the wrap on the server for that? No, 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 no. So on the server, it is stored in Solar, or Lucene, or something. No, it used to use Solar, it doesn't anymore. It uses Elasticsearch, I think. So there's yeah. no fancy way with Knife to inspect that? Information. There is. Okay. I'll show, I can show you later. There is, Knife has a tool called Search, which will allow you to find out information about all of the nodes, or clients, or recipes, or any kind of data that Chef server stores. You can also run search in recipes. So if you need no data from other nodes in a particular recipe, you can do a search. Searches are very expensive uh, because they will return every single piece of data that the <coughs> Chef server has uh, beyond the kind of regular node data you see. It'll throw in a lot of extra. In some cases, I've seen it be up to 300 megs per node. If you have a few hundred nodes, you can do the math. That's scary. Um, your network bandwidth will die. All of your memory in your chef server will be eaten up. Searches, don't use searches unless you have to. But if you have to, they're really good. There's also a new cookbook called Partial Search, which kind of does some extra magic to not use up so much bandwidth. It's pretty cool. It's a little more advanced though, and complicated. So we didn't change anything in our .kitchen.yaml. Um, let's write a test. Test slash integration. Nope, I have to make a directory first. So let's take a look at it. We have test integration default, and that's it. Um, you, have to, you have to add another directory with the test framework you're using. So this one will be called server spec. Spec helper is just server spec, stupid as you want it to be, but if you want to include stuff that will be helpful, like the exec, which will figure out how to exec on different platforms, and the detect OS, which will figure out what platform you're on and do lots and lots of magic for you, you can do it. You should. Uh, it's from somewhere else, too. It's from you, but I don't have a particular example in mind right now. So describe, well, this is pure Ruby. We can do the recipe. For some reason, people like to throw parentheses around functions and server spec. I don't know why. Do you need to describe? And so it's being solved. And that's it. So this test will just make sure both packages are installed. Uh, since we included the detect OS, it's smart enough to know that it will be running apt um, or some other method of package management. So if we do kitchen. We can see our combination should be default Ubuntu and default CentOS. There we go. We'll run kitchen. 
passes, it will delete the entire VM. Notice that the um, platforms are slightly different. They drop out all the dots. Um, they also drop out a few other things if you need kind of weird things in your YAML, like include colons or semicolons or some other kind of punctuation. Uh, Test Kitchen thinks that you're stupid for doing that and will fix it for you, which is kind of nice. But it's also a pain because you have to remember to add the dots. Those are important in the YAML. They're not important later. So here we're starting Kitchen, starts with VirtualBox and Vagrant. Um, they can't find the box because I don't have this favorite box. That's kind of horrible. I'm sorry. So it's now downloading this from Opsco. You can see here's the URL that it pulls from. It basically automatically knows all of this part. The Opsco dash vm dot bento dot s three blah blah blah, and it tacks on this part. The picture of this box. Okay, so Bento is um, Opsco now Sheffing's project for generating boxes. Uh, they have lots and lots of things. So they actually have things that Chef doesn't even really run that well on anymore, like FreeBSD 10. No one's ever really bothered to pass Isn't this basically their Packer templates? Yeah. With, with They're all Packer made. templates. So it's like uh, our Packer templates repo was actually good. Yep. So if you guys are familiar with Packer, it allows you to uh, generate a image for lots of different things. Um, in the same way every single time. You can teach it how to install something and then you pick an image out of it. So if you have like a virtual box box you want to make, which is this case, VMware, OpenStack, QMU, Packer is very, very cool. Same guy who wrote Baker with Packer. You wrote Packer and Go. Hashimoto. Yes, Hashimoto. He's a cool guy. He is a very cool guy. His GitHub is pretty intimidating. Yes. I'm not going to lie. He does everything. <laughs> I don't know how much time he has to. If you get like a favor in your spare time as a sophomore in college, you can never do that. And then make it a company you <laughs> Well, he now works full time on all his projects. Yeah. He got a console something that I'm interested in running with the lab. Mm -hmm. The what? Sorry. Console? It's their new monitoring project. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of also a competitor to NCD, which is a uh, core OS. That's what I call like. Service Security. detection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Hashimoto's kind of, he's still programming as much and is kind of more an idea guy now. He still does some programming, but he's not a good monkey anymore. So another. He might be at Oscon. I have to check to see if he's speaking. I don't, he think, might, I don't think he's speaking. He's not thinking so. But right I'm sure he'll be there. He's you always ask when I stare on Twitter. Yeah. To see these He's pretty cool. Chill guy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so box is done downloading. Downloads to a temp directory and then Baker copies it over. Now it's importing it. Takes a little while still. So this is essentially a wrapper to Baker at this point. Yep. How about to this point? Yep. Uh, so now Baker is spinning up the machine through VirtualBox. Uh, one thing to note is that even though Vagrant supports lots of different things like VirtualBox, VMware, OpenStack, Rackspace, all those kinds of things, uh, Test Kitchen only support, supports VirtualBox with Vagrant. If you want to use something else, you have to find something else to write a driver for it or write one yourself. So like, there's an OpenStack driver. It doesn't use Vagrant. Yeah, it's, it talks directly to OpenStack. Yeah. Um, hey, we failed. Resolving cookbook de dependencies. Failed. Bookshelf 2. Because it can read works file read error. I have a typo. What? I don't think the double quotes matter. Oh, it's because I'm on Bookshelf too. I forgot what the workshop is. Name called. Good job. That's because it's not Brooks file, it's workshop. They were thinking. Are you not using Shift DK? No. Not on, well, I'm, I was running Fedora for some reason. And I'm lazy. So I haven't generated anything. 
Chef TK is in a state right now where they're not really releasing packages for it. Yeah, G code. This is actually a good thing. Um, Chef did this weird thing. G code is a dependency resolver. So if you have some crazy complex dependency system like Chef does with cookbooks, uh, G code's pretty good at resolving that. They use G code in the 10 series. Then I dropped it because they didn't like running G code because it's a pain to install. And they decided to write their own implementation for the Chef server in Erlang. Turns out they're not very good at it. So they switched back to G code, which is nice. Uh, there used to be a problem where basically any case where your dependency resolution would fail, which is kind of the point of your dependency resolver, uh, the Chef server would just spin up and try and run it again. So you'd get an infinite. Um, you basically eat up an entire CPU forever until you removed one of those cookbooks and you're sorry, the Chef server. Fortunately, the Chef server with G code came back out one of the latest releases. So we switched, and now we don't have nightmares with CPU load on the shop server. Chef server is also written in Erlang. There was a switch uh, in the middle of the 10 series. Um, turns out Ruby is kind of a pain to optimize and run fast. So they decided to switch to Erlang instead of figuring out how to optimize Ruby. It's worked fairly well, but um, it's pretty much completely dried up contributions to Chef Server because no one who writes Ruby wants to learn Erlang, I guess. I know when they switched to that, I, I was at Scale a couple years ago on Facebook. Engineer really uh, a talk. That was actually one of the talks that really convinced me at least to have a second look at Chef. Yeah. And he was talking about how when they switched to Urshef, um, they could easily have uh, 17 to 20,000 nodes hit that one. Yeah, they went from about 1,000 or less to 17 to 20,000. Yeah, it was nuts. The the reason they do this is because I keep saying ops code. Ops code used to be what the company was called. Now it's called Chef Inc. Um, or Chef Software Inc. or something. People just call it Chef Inc. So if I say it, it's interchangeable. Uh, they, although they open sourced all this, and we open source one. So they want you to pay for it and use it, which works really well if you have 17,000 nodes. They're pretty good at optimizing uh, early in that sense. But there's exactly one contributor outside of ops code to the Chef server uh, since they switched to Erlang. That's like two years. Uh, one person has, con has contributed. And it was a config fix. It wasn't code. G code's really cool, I promise. It's a pain when you have to install yeah. it for the first time. So G code is written in C. And you have to compile some extensions and headers. It takes forever. G code is very, very large. Which is also part of the reason they switched, is because it is huge. It's a massive project. Turns out it's massive because it works. Before there was a system distributing binary dependencies. So do you know do you know the history of Ruby developers and binary packaging systems? It seems to me there used to be there wasn't one. Um, no, there's a very long and detailed Rather history. So um, Python has pretty long release and the release and support cycles, right? Um, I think the 2.7 series is, what, 10 years of support? And they're on, like, five years of it now or something. Um, basically, Debian started packaging Python stuff, and all the Python developers said, well, you're way too slow, because Debian is really slow at packaging things. Um, so they slowed down and kind of kept pace a little bit more and supported things longer. Ruby said, screw that. Um, developed everything their own way which works. They develop things quickly. But it also means that binary packages aren't a thing in Ruby. Someday this will finish.
maybe. Yeah, or if people have questions so far. Yeah. We've kind of gone over a lot of stuff. Yeah, I can go back over stuff. I can just keep talking about random things. I would talk about what I worked on today, but I worked on this. So, ChatGPT so, doesn't have plans for 1404? No. You don't use Ubuntu, it's fine. So, um. <laughs> Publicly, about two months ago, maybe three and a half. The idea behind ChefDK is a giant binary package that you can install on your workstation, and it has everything you need to develop and test Chef stuff. So it has it installs Test Kitchen, Birch Shelf, um, this cool thing called Knife Vault and Chef Vault. Um, it installs lots and lots of Chef gems, Chef related Ruby gems that you want. It has G code already built for you. Fun things like that. Uh, it also has a couple of extra tools. There's one called Chef, which does cool stuff. But no one's really started using it all that much yet. And even though uh, Chef has this really cool binary dish, it's pretty cool. It's really cool. Uh, binary distribution called Omnibus where essentially they use Test Kitchen to spin up a VM of some distribution and build everything from scratch and then package that. They just use FVM to package it. And then they give that package to everyone. The downsides are they're massive. They're usually two, 300 megs easy, at least. It literally repackages everything. There are no library dependencies on the platform itself. So you rebuild everything, you rebuild Ruby. Actually, it rebuilds Ruby to run a new chef on, because not all platforms support the newer chef uh, with their version, like Ubuntu 10.04, still supporting ancient version of Ruby more and newer chefs. It's basically like Gen 2 prefix. Yep. They, they then it makes a binary package at the end. Yep. And I've been doing using this quite a bit for making a uh, uh, a binary distribution of uh, Ganetti, so that all the development we do right now, the bigger boxes, they spin up and compile Gennady. Well, Gennady's dependencies has grown quite a bit. Mm -hmm. It's doing a lot more Haskell stuff, and it takes yeah. a lot of RAM to actually link everything together, which we don't want to do all the time when we spin up with Gennady in the test things, or in the build environment for getting my manager. So my what I've been working on is creating an omnibus package build of Gennady that works on any platform. So all that has to happen to you is install this package, and it's done. And the other cool thing that I want us to eventually do on the dev side is Orbeez Central, PE, and what manager, making them all omnibus installs. I actually have an omnibus installer for GWM. It doesn't handle uh, some of the hit dependencies. Yet, yeah, it needs some it, work, but it's getting there. But the, the nice thing about that is you don't really have to worry about virtual lamps because it yep. basically is a virtual lamp. Yep. And you don't have to worry about what version, you know, Oh, I really need to have Python, whatever. You don't have to worry about it. That will be good. Omnibus will build it for you. Yep. So it's a really neat tool. It's moving quite a bit. There's a little bit of growing pains, but I've been enjoying it. But I find it amusing being that I'm a Jitsu developer, or I was, that it's essentially replaced and replicated what Jitsu kind of does. Yep. Anyway, the sidetrack of that is that they have an Omnibus builder for Chef DK, but they actually just don't distribute the binaries that they built because they mostly use it internally, and they only use it between 1204, Fedora 20, and OSL. Yay! Yeah. It's done. Oh, just kidding. Jeff's doesn't take as long. There we go. No, you already take a little bit. Huh? Um, you may already have it, though. I already have it. Because I had the older version of Chef, and we didn't change in the computer. Whatever. If I had thought ahead of time, I would have not installed this documentation stuff because it builds two versions of documentation for everything. Now, kitchen test. I probably should have uninstalled the old version of Burke Shelf. We'll see which one it picks. Should pick three. We'll know pretty quickly here. Yep. So in this case, you can see the shift build at the end because I ran a test. Um, 
And then it creates the ABM again, import, imports the virtual box box because I already have it in favorite now. It doesn't need to, that's data box, sorry. Uh, it doesn't need to download it again. Other fun thing is you don't really pay attention and destroy. Like, say, we have a firewall cookbook which tests every recipe. There's like you know, 15 recipes, tests all of them individually in a couple of different ways. You can spend up like 30 VMs doing that. Uh, if you don't shut this stuff down, it's up some resources. I had a 200 gigs the other day. I forgot to delete those and destroy things. It's easy to clean up though. So uh, here, came up successfully, got the cookbook successfully, and now it's downloading Chef. And the reason it does this is because Chef moves quickly, so they don't want to rebuild all of their boxes every time. They download it every time. Also kind of nice, because then you don't have to worry about whether you're running the latest version or not. It just does it for you. If you want to run an older version, you can specify it in uh, kitchen.yaml. It will pick up an older one for you, which is convenient. So, Chef actually, Opscode wrote, you see here, it pulls in a little bash script. They wrote a bash script to figure out what platform you're running in a folder version of the Chef package. They package Chef on the bus now, um, we were talking about earlier. So, in theory, it always just works. So now we're getting to the actual Chef run. You can see, sort of run list. The run list is just that one recipe. Um, here, it's executing app update update. That's the app's cookbook. Um, it, does, it changes the app, the, um, app package resource a little bit, so it knows to actually do the updates, um, which is really nice. Otherwise, this would probably fail. Uh, yeah. Executing it to get updated, blah, blah, blah. Now we're on to package bin. This is our actual recipe. Uh, every package that you install or all of your other things, it does them all individually in sequential order from where they're defined, which means it will run apt get install, apt get install, apt get install on every single package individually. Which might sound weird. There's good reasons for doing that. So does that mean it's rebuilding package cache every single time? Yeah. Sweet. Package cache, library, LD load, um, LDD. It's not that much overhead. It is on the workstations. Oh, no. Workstations uh, is quite slow. You can see here, I, installing them just not. It's a little bit slower than actual just running around using the um, app gate install. It's not too bad though. Kind of a funny story. Uh, when Chef was originally written, no one thought that Chef would run for more than 15 minutes on uh, an individual Chef run. So they set a timer when you authenticate with your client. Um, every node has a client. When you authenticate with the Chef server, it sets a timeout. It gives you a token, uh, and you use that token to get new data, so you have to log in every single time you authenticate the keys. Now that token expires in about 15 minutes, so, and it doesn't reauthenticate. No one actually bothered to add that, which is kind of odd. So if you just have to take more than 15 minutes, and then you try and pull more data from the Chef server, uh, it'll fail. And you should rerun it again. There's a to fix it to, they said it's eight hours now, I think. One poor soul who says he's run seek over 24. Come to him and bug with it. Yeah, so um, right up at the top here, you can see it says finished converging. That's the end of the shot run. This is more kitchen stuff, fetching some gems, successfully installed Thor, Busser, uh, installed those gems, figures out, plug in server spec install. That's the Busser thing. Um, Busser is what runs these things. Actual server spec tests, they're pretty plain. Um, output is green, fast, you're good, drag, you fail. Two seconds of failure. So it worked. And you can see that they're talking about to show you everything. Because uh, essentially we don't care if the test pass. We don't need to go debug things. So yeah, I mean that's kind of your basic, pretty simple getting a cookbook up and going with tests. Do you have any questions? Is there anything anyone wants to see that I haven't covered at all? There's lots of things I haven't covered.
No? Anything you want to know about, Lance, that I haven't talked about? Well, do you have other slides, or is this basically what you're doing this time around? Uh, that's basically just what I was doing this time. I just wanted to give an introduction, get everyone familiar. You with might it. go through the workflow a little bit. Okay, yeah. So um, let's find out how good our documentation is. Because that's, that's the point where it yep. can get really confusing over tasks. Yep. So if you go to, which is kind of a horrible thing to search for if you're trying to set up Chef, but workstation configuration, I need to rename this page. Daniel, you should write that down. Oh. You, you're taking notes, right? Yeah. yeah. Want me to I need to rename this. Uh, so there's some warnings. Actually, some of those are dated. I was looking over that earlier. If you don't need to install Chef anymore. Required gems, not all of these are installed by Chef DK, so you can install them. Uh, the Chef Gem install will install them in your home drawer. It's not global, so you don't need to run sudo. Please don't run sudo. Um, some of those are really cool. Knife Solved is awesome. This saved my life because Knife Solved actually could resolve dependencies when Chef Server couldn't. Uh, so anytime I had to go figure out why, what dependency Chef Server was failing on and exploding, Knife Solved would just tell me in like three seconds. It's really awesome. Uh, the Chef DK binary to your path, you don't strictly have to do that. You should. Um, as part of the package that it installs, it'll set up some symlinks in user local bin and desk bin, I think. Uh, so the repository, we went over that for the workflow. Uh, most of this is just the workstation setup and not actually the workflow. Uh, configuring knife, um, there's kind of an example of our basic knife configuration. You might want to add a few things from there. We'll take a look at that. Configuring a nice work. Nice work is something we use quite a bit. Uh, it's nice because it simplifies a lot of knife commands that you'll be running for kind of general stuff for general uh, workflow. So it's a pretty simple uh, setup. It's just a YAML file it goes in your .chef sport config YAML. Uh, if you get an error about food critic not being able to be found, let me know. That error is going around for a while. You can also just disable it by putting enabled false. Um, but you really should be running food critic. Food critic's pretty cool. Configuring Burkshelf. Um, this is probably outdated now because Burkshelf 3 has come out. But you can tell it the chef server you want to talk to, by default, it'll look at your, your knife.rd in your chef folder. So you don't actually have to put any of this there. But if you want to explicitly put it there, you can. Uh, you don't need to worry about copying the config to other workstations anymore. Um, no, that's the wrong one. Yeah, that's not what I wanted. Um, so now the actual workflow one. So you go to the repo, run git pull. Uh, one thing is that MR does not update the root repository. So you still need to update that. I like pull dash dash rebase because I like rebasing. MR update updates everything. Um, if it fails, it fails. Uh, if you're working on a cookbook and it fails to update that one, you're probably on a branch that's not master uh, and not checked out properly. That's fairly straightforward to fix. It's not too bad. Uh, next work check. Next work check will look at your chef server and it'll look at your local stuff. It'll figure out what version of the cookbook exists where. So it'll, like, for example, uh, It will list all the cookbooks, and it'll list the newest version of all of them. Um, so if we do knife cookbook, that will show us all of the versions of Workstation it has. Uh, you can see there's quite a few of them. I go through and clean these up occasionally uh, and take out old versions. So nice work check. It'll say, oh, look, 1.3.12 is your newest one. Um, now, it, and then it'll ask you, do you want to bump to 1.3.13? Do knife sport? Wow. Let's see what it does. Um, see, it says workstation does not yet exist on the chef server. I've noticed since the 
right yeah, OK, cool. So my knife config is conflicting with the one in the root of the chef repo because I set up some weird stuff. Shouldn't do that. If it does that, let me know. So it means we need to fix things. Knife, sport, check. Also to work, because it'll use. No, oh, that's my version of Node into stream. This is Ruby being strongly typed. Uh, you can tell how useful Ruby is. It's providing errors. No, that's actually a knife. I shouldn't blame Ruby. No, I didn't actually mean debug. If you will give you all of its help output help output. So we want dash capital B. Some of the subcommands have their own flags that are completely different. So in this case, sport probably has its own. So if we do dash dash help here, we'll get sporks. Yeah, see knife spork check cookbook. We actually want to pass the dash capital V here. If you uh, are familiar with the BSD utils, you know that location of flags matters. In GNU utils, it doesn't. Um, and it turns out in knife, it matters. No implicit conversion of now into stream. This happens. Knife is really not very helpful sometimes. No chef ignore found. Oh, I see. I see. This is because my knife.rb is really screwed up and is not looking in the chef repo. And if I switch to the chef repo, it's not talking to the chef server correctly. So I'm going to copy it because I should. And copy it to Yeah, see, that's way way too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my local version is one three five. I haven't updated in a while. It tells us all the remote versions. The star indicates frozen. That means that if you try and upload that version again, Chef Server will yell at you. You can force it to do it. And it'll say, you're being stupid. You shouldn't do this, and it'll do it. But um, generally, you don't want to force anything. Uh, you always want a version bump. So we do a knife spork bump. You can guess what that does. Successfully bumped workstation. It is not reading the chef server correctly. It bumped me to 136. That's sad. OK, reset. By the way, is no. Modify your metadata.rb. Seems to changes for you. Just changes the version. If next work just stops working, sometimes I just change the version instead because I can. Get a point. Now, bump workstation. This is why you run MR update at the beginning. Successfully bumped workstation to version 1.3.12. Cool. Oh, look. Someone did something fun, which happens a lot. So one three eleven. That's not 1.3.12. That means somebody uploaded a version of, they changed the cookbook probably committed it locally and never pushed. So there's a new version on the Chef server and an old version in Git. This is a problem. Um, people haven't really figured out a good way to do it, other than to start yelling at everyone until they start pushing. But I've done this like six times. So if you do it, I won't yell at you. I promise. I probably won't yell at you. Hopefully sometime we can figure out a way with Jenkins. Yeah, we should. Um, so I'm going to go. I want number 9, which is 1 through 12. So now it's just a uh, nice cookbook download. Just downloads the cookbook from the Chef server. So now I have it locally. Turn on a diff. Version bump. And you didn't do a recursive. Oh, I didn't do a recursive diff, did I? No wonder. 
There we go. So in 1 through 12, somebody added a package version and action install and changed it. So let's take a look at that. Good job. Now we can all yell at Daniel. <laughs> you want to push that? Uh, there's there's no Git on the on the um, Chef server. So if, if, if there's a Git repo, there'd be a dot .git right here. That means it's a Git repo. Chef server is smart enough to strip out things you don't actually want, like dot .git. Uh, there's also a thing called Chef Ignore, which if you have other random files that Chef server does not know to strip out, it'll strip those out too. Kind of nice. Like the dot .git Ignore doesn't need to be there. Dot .rshvac doesn't necessarily need to be there. Mm. Got rid of the test though. Did you push it yet? Uh, Good job. So, not on the server. Let's pick a different. Let's go to base. Base is. Everything that we can't fit everywhere else. Uh, there's lots of craft in here. I've been working on cleaning it up, but you can see we actually this is in my workstation. We have some kitchen stuff. We don't have to have. Here we base. See, yeah. Now there's. I think I added a bunch of these tests. Yeah, some of them don't need to be chef zero. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, knives. That's gonna fail. I'm sorry. No workstation. It's gonna say the same thing. You're good. See your local version. Okay. This is what would normally happen when you're updated to date and no one's done anything crazy on the Chef server. Um, it says, warning, your local version is frozen on the Chef server. So you tried to match cookbook up with it fail. Um, you need to bump before you can upload. So you just click yes, and it'll change things for you. Um, so that eliminates the next fork bump command that I was running earlier. Uh, as you see now. Just bumped it for me. That's all it did. These recipes. Lots of recipes in there. Um, if we go back to the workflow, you can see kind of the next step is do stuff with your cookbook. We actually need to change number three to be test kitchen. Yeah. Um, we used to test with Vagrant and Vagrant Bookshelf and Chef Solo or Chef Server. Um, Jeremy didn't want to do Chef Server. I should say test kitchen. Test kitchen is the only good. Workshop Vagrant is a plugin that's deprecated, kind of. That's a fun story. Um, because Vagrant keeps changing its APIs and it breaks Vagrant Workshop. Oh, it did. got sick and tired of trying to keep up with the APIs. Yep. <laughs> so let's see. What's a good one? Um, This is just a well, this one's actually kind of cool. No, I shouldn't show you that. That was um, there's a Jira cookbook that I use, and Chef, if you try and specify the same resource multiple times, it will just use the first one that's defined. You can't overwrite or merge things. So if you want to change something someone has done, there's a magical gem which will do all of this for you, and that uses that. But you shouldn't have to use that in most cases. So I'm not going to show it to you. Let's look at managed. Managed is Fairly simple now. Uh, there used to be lots and lots of stuff in here, but I like to show this one because it's a good example. So, do monitoring. This is for the nacho stuff because uh, we don't have anywhere else to put it. We won't put the nacho cookbook uh, because the nacho cookbook has not shown. We don't need our stuff there. Monitoring host, local host, 
Um, unless Chef wants to solo, there's Chinese performing solo, a bunch of servers you can switch to the Chef solo. There's a couple of fixes that actually, but it's not needed ever. This is the search that I was talking about. Search, you're searching for a node, it's searching for roles, and we have an attribute that's interpolated right here that has that note, that um, the role that we're searching for. And then for every node it finds, it does some stuff. I'll show you what the search looks like. Um, first, we have to figure out what the role looks like. So let's take a look at the roles. So I believe it's OSL Nagia. No, it's not. Monitoring. Monitoring. There it is. Thank you, Lance. This is a real role. It does stuff. It's exciting. Um, so you can see that that search searches for machines that are running this. Because if they're running this, they're running the see the recipe Nagia server. That's the recipe that installs the server. So only mon1 runs this right now, I think. So if we do knife, syntax, that the S on roles is important. Um, if you do a knife search and it's just cookbook or recipe or role, it will only search the first one that comes up in the list. It won't search all of them. So you have the S and it searches everything. Um, so if we do knife search node roles monitoring, should probably come up. Okay, so RD test is also running it. Um, you can see here it kind of gives you some. These are some of the attributes actually. So like this is the entire expanded realm that I was talking about for RD test n. And it saves. Um, there's some other useful things. So we go back to the cookbook and the recipe that I'm showing you, which was um, this node now. This is really, really bad, actually. Let's fix this. This is good. I found something wrong. Um, does anyone know what variable shadowing is in scopes? Jack? No. Oh, OK. I did very little movie as part of recovery. Sorry. OK. So node. Now I was talking about how you access attributes by node, and it's a hash, right? That's a global thing. It's everywhere. So when we call this block right here, when the search search takes a block, and this node right here, this is a different node. This is all the nodes the search returns. So we're calling this node. There's already a node. If we wanted to re to reference the entire node, the node we're actually running this recipe on, we can't because we change into something else. We pop back out of this scope down here at the end, then it's all fine. Uh, this is really bad. We don't want to do this. Also, it's really confusing, because you expect node to be the current node you're running on. Now it's the node you're searching. Let's change it. Most people just use n, because it's short. n. Another node. I know there's some other nodes before, too. Um, so do n. N is one of the nodes that iterates. The search just returns an array of nodes. Um, now we're looking at the, at the network attribute, which has another hash interfaces, which is an array. Dot collect, which returns another array. So for each of those interfaces, you look at the address, all, all of the addresses, because uh, the interface comes with addresses, the P addresses. Uh, dot select. Dot select is just a filter. So if the statement in this block returns true, then it pulls that line. Otherwise, it discards it. Forgets about it. So, address data is key. Um, this address is a hash. Address is the key. Data is the value. Data family is equal to inet. Keys. We want all those keys. Um, so we're only selecting the addresses where those are hash. That's a key to a value when the family is equal to inet. In that and we do dot keys, um, which just gives us those addresses, um, drops out all the values. Dot flatten, if you have arrays within arrays, just makes one array. It pulls everything up until it's on the first level. Dot each, we're iterating over yet another array. You see, this is really common to do pass you have blocks inside blocks inside blocks. Uh, for each IP address, because we each have an array of IP addresses. 
we want to add it to this list up here, monitor your host. So the entire idea is everything that has that monitoring role is monitoring hosts, right? So when we run through all these blocks, we search, we find everything that's monitoring hosts, we find all of its IP addresses, because we could have tons of them. That's at least two, uh, hopefully. At least two. Uh, we know it's always local host, because local host is always local host. So we find all the other IP addresses. We store them in this array, right? And then for this, this is an example of setting a node in a, in a recipe. And this, we set the allowed hosts, not just allowed hosts, to uh, the unique set of districts. So we take out two bits because we probably see bits in there. And 27.0.0.1, which I want to times. Is there a reason why Y23 needs to be one whole line? No. Because it seems like that's really hard to read. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I guess it started out 30 characters long yeah. and then grew long. And yeah. probably started out like someone thought, oh, this is all I need. Addresses, we're good. Uh, and then, oh no, wait, we want these addresses. No, wait, now we want the keys because we're pulling in the values too. And now we want to flatten the entire thing to so erase and erase and erase. We don't want to do crazy iteration stuff. Um, so, dot collected dot select, you'll see um, use curly braces a lot because they're usually pretty short. I mean, we get over in this case, since we combine all of them, it's way too much. So, the change you're making from for the iterator variable is a flaw, but maybe not a bug. No, we're expecting it to not change any behavior. It, it, yes, it should not change behavior now because we're not referencing the global node inside of the block. You're correct. It will not actually, there's no, nothing breaking here. There is. And by changing it, you're also not breaking anything. Yes, by changing it, I'm also not breaking anything because I'm just renaming a, an array, a, a variable. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Uh, so while we're here, let's clean up these blocks. So this becomes a do. And no, sorry. Do, and then you need the pipes after it, and then new line. Ruby uses two spaces for tab stop instead of four. Um, they like to be annoying. Yeah. Um, so you'll notice the ending curly brace that I replaced with this do. The ending curly brace is actually all the way over here. So let's swap that out for an end. And bam. Go back down. Uh, and here we need to add another do. Does anyone have any questions? I can see when you're not doing the do end thing that it makes more sense to string along the yeah. dot this dot that nonsense. It it's, makes more sense. It's really weird in Ruby to do end dot method. Right. Um, because a lot of people don't realize that do end is like is is an object, a Ruby object. Uh, everything in Ruby is an object, um, and objects have methods. So it looks weird. It's not. It it's something you generally don't want to do. So um, now we want to move this to its own line. This is just fixing things. So now do do keep indenting and dot keys and dot flatten dot each do IP address and 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 if we really wanted to make this look nicer, uh, we would probably pull this select into a variable and then do um, we would do variable name dot keys and then pull it in that way instead of doing end dot keys. Let's not go too crazy with this for now. So we'll just fix um, Vim checks my Ruby syntax for me. It's really quite nice. Git status. Let's see what we changed. Oh, not in Git right because <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting on my. So you can see we've modified the metadata. It's already added it. That was the nice spork bump stuff we did. And we've changed the manage.rb to make sure um, I didn't lose a couple of lines somewhere. It looks, huh? Yeah, it's complaining about your white space. But is this, would this be something you would test kitchen before committing? Yes. Be like, Let's I'm not actually going to commit this right, right now. Right. But if you well, were, yeah. 
So if, if I were living on the edge and wanted to push this out on the Chef server in front of all of you and you could watch it break and you could all laugh at me. <laughs> on the first day before a three-day weekend. This would break Nagios for all of our Chef stuff. So what do we do? Because really, we just want linting or something for this kind of test. Yeah, yeah. So, but server spec doesn't do that. So what, what lending suite do we use for programs? That's a great question. Uh, so, um, server spec, does everyone see why server spec wouldn't handle this very well? If you guys know. Um, we're storing all this in an attribute. That's our goal, right? Was to store this, set this as an attribute in the recipe. Server spec does not understand chef. It does not understand attributes. So we'd either have to write a test that goes and uses this wherever that attribute ends up and make sure it actually ends up somewhere, write another recipe that adds it to a file so we can check it, or use chef spec, which can actually look at attributes. Um, you can just check the attributes that way. Technically, uh, uh, yeah, it is. So. Uh, lots of people also use RuboCop. You, people use right. both because RuboCop will actually want Food Critic does not really land Ruby that well. It lands Chef, which is slightly different from Ruby. It's so always Ruby. But so Food Critic even not ERP. Really? Yes, it will check ERP. Okay. Food Critic will check, it will check, I believe it checks JSON. If not, then I think Knife checks JSON or something. Um, it will check all of your .rbs. Basically anything that is a, you'll check your attribute files, your recipe files, your template files, your, um, you'll check your metadata, metadata.rd for you. Does this make sense what I did? Do you have any questions? Do you think I'm crazy? Probably should be thinking I'm crazy. I mean, all we did was, remember how I talked about how curly braces and do end is interchangeable? This was a huge volume, so we shortened it. And we just switch it to do end because we like to not do curly braces over multiple lines. And then Ruby would look like C or something. Nobody really wants that. I notice there's very little line um, things as functions or methods. It's all one giant mess of yeah. here it is. Yeah, and Ruby, everything's everything. Or nothing, or something. Um, this is one of the really interesting things that I don't like about Ruby is it's dynamic. And everything is everything. Like you don't really just throw types out the window. Okay. I mean, your okay. test will units become arbitrarily large. Yeah. Sure. Sure. It's easier to test that way. One thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when Ruby lets you write functions and have unit tests. Chef, on the other hand, has, is not like that. There are unit tests for Chef. Chef spec. Yeah, but you're, most of our students will not need to be writing. Yeah, Chef Spec is entirely useless. <laughs> All it does is lint. It reads your Ruby and says, oh, hey, I'm pretty sure if Chef ran this, it would try and install this package. So it is in trying to install this package. Good job. It doesn't actually run the Chef. That's why they invented Test Kitchen. So something would actually run things. Because lint linting makes sense for syntax stuff. It doesn't really make sense for unit testing at all. Certainly not for integration. And yeah, not at all for integration. So for, for a couple of years, like two years, um, all Chef had was Chef Sec and Food Critic. So you could learn and then you can learn some more. You couldn't unit test, really. You couldn't integration test. That's how I guess the score. <laughs> yep. It's the ultimate integration test. Yeah. So is this helpful? Yeah. Did I just like fire hose everything at you? Is it too much? Jeffrey, you good? I did. Tiny bit? Are you less terrified of Chef? Good. That's it. It's okay to be terrified of Chef. I'm terrified of Chef. It's not good. It's probably the other one. I'm Chef's my service back. Yeah. Chef is actually a little bit more frightening than when I walked in. Yeah. That's okay. You'll get comfortable with it. That's the weird thing. This will all be normal in a couple weeks. <laughs> After shit. Like, yeah. Yeah. This, this is actually pretty, it's kind of a bad example and then it's really complicated. I can show you simpler if you want. 
I'll do something simple. So, um, station cookbook, even though I know it's not going to work right because. is our package recipe. It installs all the packages we could ever want on our workstations. So we have an attribute, no workstation packages. Everything in there gets installed. We iterate over the entire array. Each time we do a package feed, we do action upgrade, because if you just do install, it will install one version and never operate. Anyways, stop the upgrade. And so those are all defined in the environment. I'm getting to that, yeah. Okay. I'm and since they're done individually, it skips over that help back crap. Yeah. Right on. Yep. Um, yeah, so each one installs individually. Um, and that's kind of nice because if one fails, you know exactly which one failed. You don't have to dig through your apps and logs. Uh, and then there's a purge package. It's purge is just removing your plus, like really removing your things. Remove config files, too. Regular remove won't do that. So uh, if you take a look, let's back up. Take there's not even a package. In here, we search for package. There's nothing. There's repos. That's some other stuff. I can show you that if you want. We also do. We do the same thing. We iterate over all of the repositories we want and add them before we add the packages. Environment. Default attributes. Workstation packages. This is where it all gets defined. It's a pretty good list. No, I don't see any version numbers there. No. Nope. I wanted that particular version of Xmonad. I'm kind of screwed using that tool, right? Yeah, you'd have to rewrite it. Okay, right It's not the end. You know, it doesn't matter because right? we're running stable Debian. <laughs> 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 Maybe it's back for it. <laughs> That's a good point. Is there a package anyone wants on the workstations? I already got one. We're going to be playing it right now, but. Yeah. So yeah, all you do if you want to add a package, you know, give me a package that's not on this list. <laughs> oh yeah, zero AD is not on the list yet. No, everything. Other Jeff. So we add zero AD, okay? Um, because this is with workbooks, we don't have to do all the nice work stuff. Uh, we have Jenkins jobs that will upload everything for you, so you just commit. Okay, so look, where did you whiskey come from? That's weird. Repository, and I know it's going to break things. Stash is awesome. Okay, status. Cool. So that means your IDs. Yeah. I just didn't have a new version. We'd remove it. Remove com. Remove com. Oh no, no more com key. Uh, Jigo was saying that the one that she was saying that the same one that has a password platform. Okay. Uh, so get commit. Remove. Version master. Um, let's take a look. There's a Jenkins job. All of the uploading and everything for us. It all do. Which is good. So um, there's the Chef data bags. That's just for Chef data bags. Um, it's kind of a legacy thing. We used to keep data bags in a different area, and uh, so they get checked differently. There's Chef production. That is all of the environments and roles. We'll go here. So you can see here's my remove conky. <coughs> Take a look at the details. This is my commit. It uploaded. It succeeded. That means it's on the Chef server now. So if we do knife search node at workstation. 
you want everything after it works. Um, okay. A just means only show me this particular attribute, don't show me anything else. I really want to see everything about the workstations. Oh, great. Zero items found. Sometimes that happens. Chefs, I get things wrong a lot. Search everything that has workstation up. Or this will just show everything that has a name, which is everything. But it will show workstation.packages. So see, lots of things don't have workstation.packages. We see one that does. And look, no conky. Oh, conky's still there. Uh, no, I didn't run chef. That's why. <laughs> this is actually a really good example. So chef server. Knife environment. Knife show environment. Everything that the chef server has for the um, environment called workstation. The dash capital FJ means show me in format JSON. Otherwise, it'll show you like this weird message file or direct knife environment show. Want to get the ordering right. There we go. So it won't be on this list. So you know Conky, right? The reason it still showed up in the workstation is because Chef has not been run on the workstation, so none of the node attributes have been changed. When you start the Chef run, it will look through all of its node attributes. It will look through its environment attributes. It will compile the entire list. At the end of the run, it will save it back to the Chef server. So if you started that Chef run, by the time it got back to the office, it'd be gone. It'd be gone. Conky um, would be gone from the node. No. It won't remove it if it's not in the packages. It, it won't remove through. the package. Yeah. So but it won't be on this list. Right. Conky will still be installed. Uh, yeah. That is really, that's, yeah. so this is an important, did everyone get that? Does that make sense? <clears throat> if you don't tell Chef to install something, it's not going to uninstall it. Yes, which is no longer manageable. Yes. Configure is different than remove. Unconfigure is different right. than remove. You know, this is, so that also means that if I did something, if I screwed something up and added like some file I don't want, I can't just get revert. I can't get revert. It won't add it again. It won't remove it either. That's weird. But it's important to remember. Yeah. Any other questions? No. So everyone will go home and take a nap now. I did. But I also slept for like two hours last night. Had a kid. <laughs> Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Have fun. <laughs>